This is the Hale Ray Biology Lecture on Evolution. Make sure that you have your lecture note guide out and you're filling it in as we go along. You can also record any questions that you have and bring them to me tomorrow in class and we'll have a class discussion. One of the reasons that there's a lot of controversy surrounding evolution is because people don't really understand the word theory. Theory has a very different meaning in science than it does in everyday life. In science, theories are statements or models that have been tested and confirmed many times. An example of this is the theory of gravity or the cell theory. Theories have some very important properties. Theories are able to explain a wide variety of data and observations. The theory of evolution takes into account data and observations from fossils, from today, um, anatomy, biochemistry, there's a lot of different observations that come into the theory of evolution. Theories are used to make predictions. For example, the theory of gravity helps predict that when you throw a ball up, it will come down. And theories are also not absolute. They serve as a model of understanding the world around us, but they can be changed as the world view changes. In science, the term theory does not express doubt. There is not doubt surrounding the theory of evolution. In common terms, a theory is a hunch, something that you think might happen, but you don't really have a lot of data to back it up. For example, I could have a theory that the Red Sox will win the World Series. That's a common theory. In science, a theory has a lot of data, a lot of testing that backs it up. They have been confirmed through tests and observations. And the theory of evolution is one of the most useful theories in biology because it explains many questions and observations that we've had. Some of those questions are, why do so many different animals have the same structures, such as the arm bones in a human and the flipper in a whale? Why do organisms have structures they no longer use? like the appendix in a human, or non-functioning wings in penguins? Why are there bones and fossil evidence of creatures that no longer exist? What happened to these creatures? Why do so many organisms' morphology and anatomy follow the same plan? So why do so many organisms look similar when they're not the same? Why is the sequence of DNA very similar in some groups of organisms, but not in others? And finally, why do the embryos of animals look very similar at early stages? So, these are some of the questions that evolution answers, but it's definitely not all of the questions that evolution answers. The theory of evolution is considered a unifying theory of biology. It unites all of the units that we've been talking about throughout the year, because it answers many of the questions that we posed and offers an explanation for the data. I want to emphasize here that the theory of evolution does not talk about the origin of life, how life started. Really what we're talking about here is how species originated, how life became different, how we got so many different animals, so many different plants, so many different organisms, but definitely not how life started. And scientists have known for a long time that evolution has been happening, and there's been lots of different ideas of how evolution happens. And one of those ideas was posed by a scientist named Lamarck. Lamarck had a theory of acquired characteristics, which he, so Lamarck thought that a, char a characteristic would be acquired during an individual's lifetime, an individual organism. He thought you would lose or gain features if you didn't use them or overuse them, and you could pass these new traits on to your offspring. For example, a lizard that didn't use its legs would eventually not have legs, and its offspring wouldn't have legs, so they would become snake. Or a giraffe that stretched its neck to reach higher leaves on a tree would have babies with longer necks. Lamarck's theory was eventually discarded. It was proven to be wrong. And the reason why is that it really doesn't work logically. If you were in a car accident and had your leg amputated, it doesn't mean your children will only have one leg. We kind of know that inherently as humans. So features gained during your life are not passed on to children, which goes for the same for our plants, animals, all organisms. 
After Lamarck came a scientist called Charles Darwin, and he is the big guy in evolution. He is really who we're going to talk about, and we'll talk about his theory of evolution by natural selection. So that's really Darwin's big word, is natural selection. Darwin was a naturalist, or a scientist who studied nature, and he observed many species. He traveled to the Galapagos Islands, which are a group of islands near Ecuador, and he observed the finches and small birds there. He also observed turtles and lots of other different animals. And based on his observations of those animals, he wrote a book called The Origin of Species. The Origin of Species talks about four main points. The first point is that variation exists among individuals in a species. If you think about the human species, you can see that there's tons of variation between you and the person sitting next to you or the person across the world from you. So there's lots of different variations within a species. The second thing that Origin of Species talks about is that individuals will compete for resources, food and space. The third thing is that the, this competition could lead to the death of some individuals while others would survive. So if you're better at competing for food and space, you're going to survive. And the individuals who are not as good at competing as for food and space will not survive as well or as often. And that's kind of the point of number four. Individuals that have advantageous variations, things that are different about them that help them survive, are more likely to survive and they're going to have more kids. They're going to reproduce even more. This theory is called natural selection. Some people call it survival of the fittest. Fit in this case meaning most well adapted to their environment. So organisms that are best at living in their environment. And the favorable variations are called adaptations. So Darwin's finches, um, Darwin noticed that all the finches on the Galapagos Island looked about the same except for the shape of their beak, as you can see in this picture here. His observations led to the conclusion that all the finches were descendants of the same original population. The shape of the beaks were adaptations for eating a particular type of food. For example, long beaks were used for eating insects, Shorts, short beaks were used for eating seeds because they're better at crushing those shells. So that's one example of evolution that Darwin noticed. Evidence of evolution includes the fossil record. If today's species came from ancient species, then we should be able to find the remains of species that no longer exist. Not all things can be fossilized, so we don't see all the species. We, the ones that we do see share many common features with today's organisms. In order to date these species, we use a technique called carbon dating which gives an age of a sample based on the amount of radioactive carbon that's in that sample. And the fossil record overall creates a geologic time scale of when these organisms may have been alive. Another piece of evidence of evolution is the Hawaiian honey creeper, which is found in Hawaii. There's 31 different species of bird, and they all had a common ancestor. And these species have become really well adapted to particular areas in Hawaii. Um, they're really well fit for eating different creatures there, having different food sources. And as you know, note, as you can see from the picture, they all look very, very different. And those species originally came from one species as they're in their ancestry. Another piece of evidence of evolution is called homologous structures. These are structures that are embryologically similar, but have very different functions. So they're similar when you're a very, very new creature, not even born yet. But when you're an adult, when you're fully formed, these have very different functions. And in the picture, you can see one example of homologous structures. There are very similar bones in a human arm to a cat leg, a whale fin, a bat wing, a penguin wing, and an alligator foot. So these have very, very similar looks to them, but they have very, very different functions. And so this shows that there may have been a common ancestor that also had similar bone structure. Another example of evidence of evolution is vestigial organs. 
This means that it's an organ that is seemingly functionless, for example, snakes that have tiny pelvic and limb bones, or humans that have a tailbone, but they, these organs probably had a function at one time. And in the picture, it shows a whale with a pelvis and a femur. And we know that whales don't use this pelvis and femur, but they still have it. Another example of evidence is biochemistry and DNA. There's very similar molecules found in all different animals and plants. And DNA is how all organisms pass on genetic information. Much of this DNA is the same across species. And so there was probably a common ancestor that had DNA, that used DNA, and passed it along to all of the species that we have today. Another example is embryological development. An embryo is a very new fetus that's found when it's in the mother's womb, and this top row shows very new embryos. And they, you can see that across all different species, from fish to humans and rabbits and all the way in between, um, there are very many similarities. These embryos look really, really similar. And as they grow, as these embryos grow into fetuses and into babies, the similarities become fewer and fewer, and those animals differentiate. And so this is another example of evolution, because those early, early stages look so similar. There was probably a common ancestor at one point, or there was definitely a common ancestor. Another example of evolution is industrial melanism. This industrial melanism is a big word that uh, talks about man, how man can affect evolution through pollution. And the famous example of industrial melanism is peppered moths, or Kettlewell's moths, who was the scientist who studied them. In London, around the Industrial Revolution, there were peppered moths, and they were white and black, and they lived on these white and black trees, and they were really hard to see, so birds were not able to eat them very well. So there was a lot of white and black moths, and not so many totally black moths, because you could see them more easily. When the Industrial Revolution occurred, soot covered the trunks of the trees, and so now the trees looked more like this, and it's much harder to see the black moth, and much easier to see the white moth. So then the birds would eat the white moths more often, and the population of the white moths went down, and the population of the black moths went up. Nowadays, now that we have the Clean Air Act and many laws that have cleaned up the air everywhere, including London, the trees look more like this again, and so the population of white moths has gone back up, and the birds are finding those black moths a lot more easily. And so their population has gone down. Another example of evolution that's happening today is bacterial resistance to antibiotics. We've talked about this a lot, so I'm not going to go too much into it, but this picture explains how a resistant bacteria that's better at surviving uh, antibiotic treatment could um, reproduce and grow better than a non-resistant bacteria. And so that resistant bacteria develops its own strain. Elephants in Africa are also another example of evolution that's happening today. Poachers poach, kill elephants for their large tusks, for the ivory in them. So it used to be an advantage for elephants to have long tusks because they use them to fight off other elephants, to um, compete for food, compete for mates. But now that they're being killed, the elephants that are left have smaller and smaller tusks. So the elephant population overall has really small tusks. And the last example we'll talk about for today is dogs. And this is an example of artificial selection. And so you can see in this picture how human influence has created so many different types, so many different breeds of dogs. And um, their size difference even is absolutely massive. So if you think of the biggest dog and the smallest dog, their size difference is huge. So that's the lecture on evolution for today. And please write down any questions that you have to bring into the in-class discussion for next class. Thanks.